All right, good morning, everybody, um, for here in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, um, and for those across the rest of the state and across the Pacific Northwest and even across the Western United States who may be calling in and, and listening or watching online afterwards. Thank you for attending this event as part of Alaska Startup Week. So we're in Friday of the Startup Week. So uh, this is day five of the events that have been going on, going on across the state of Alaska, some in person and some virtual. Um, and today we're going to be hearing from a, a startup company that has connections to the University of Alaska Fairbanks, University of Washington, and uh, across the Western United States. But before we do that, I just want to recognize the traditional lands upon which we reside. So here at University of Alaska Fairbanks in the Trothietta campus, we are on the lands of the Denana people of the Lower Tanana River, and I want to recognize all the traditional lands upon which the rest of us reside, uh, wherever we are based, and for the past, current, and future stewardship of those lands. So on that note, and that recognition of our traditional lands, I'll pass it over to Chris Woodruff from Aquaga uh, to uh, lead today's um, presentation, and, dis and then we'll have a group discussion about some of those uh, projects that Aquaga have been working upon, and, and how we as a community here in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest can help them as they move forward. So over to you, Chris, to be able to share your slide deck. Yeah, just working on that here. Give me a sec. Is that working for you? Oh, sorry. Yes, we're all ready to go from your side. Okay, great. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, we just wanted to start with a quick note that, you know, we've, we've uh, kind of been in the Alaska ecosystem for a while now. And, and I know that a lot of folks have kind of heard about our company and our team and some of our work, but we wanted to shift kind of the structure of this a little bit. We'll do a quick intro today and then do more of a panelist with, with a few team members on here talking about some of their projects and experiences and kind of open up for Q&A there. So start off, uh, I guess we'll do introductions in, in, in the order there up there. Nigel, you wanna do a quick intro? Sure, happy to, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, Nigel Sharp, CEO, co-founder of Aquaga. Um, obviously, for the Center Ice crowd, I know the number of attendees right now. Um, you know, my prior role was was very much working with and uh, for Center Ice um, in Alaska, and I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to spin this company um, out of the University of Alaska Fairbanks and beyond um, with the team. So uh, very much the entrepreneur in the team, and uh, yeah, engaged with uh, a really wonderful team here today and, and co-panelists. And I'm really excited that we've got. Some of our new members of the team going to be speaking as well. So, uh, Chris, back to you, I guess. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, my, my role is uh, co founder, VP of engineering with the Quagga. And my, my background is uh, as a mechanical engineer. Um, got my master's from the University of Washington. Um, and I'm all, uh, actually currently based at the University of Alaska Fairbanks through a program I'll describe a little bit more in a few slides. So, I'll pass it over to Louie. All right. Thank you, Chris. So I am Louis Bastille. I am a research engineer at Aquaga, and my main uh, one of my main roles at the at this time is being based over in Idaho Falls to, to work on a project in collaboration with the Idaho National Lab, doing materials research. Josh. Yeah, I'm Josh McCacker, and I'm an uh, engineering intern at Aquaga. Uh, have my uh, BS in mechanical engineering and that wasn't good enough for me so going back for my master's uh, here at UAF and that's how I got connected to Aquaga through a program that I will also get to talk about a bit later so I think back to you Chris. Yeah and, and I'm uh, gonna pass it back to Nigel for a bit of uh, the origin story. Absolutely thank you Chris. Um... <laughs> And then we should get like a virtual baton or something to pass it between ourselves. But anyway, um, so uh, the, the word Aquaga and the team uh, name sort of uh, was an inspiration from, from a very early co-founder co conversations around, you know, trying to em embody and embrace um, this new movement that was happening across the US called uh, Zebras Unite. Um, really sort of like taking a bit of a counter initiative towards the unicorn startups that are out there um, with companies that are trying to sort of disrupt and take everything for themselves and building companies that are much more collaborative and uh, transparent in their operations and usually ha and have a core social and environmental impacts um, to their embodiment. And therefore, um, Aquaga uh, literally spells out a zebra effectively. And we're you know actively trying to be somewhat zebra-like um, with uh, some of our core values of honesty and fairness to one another um, alongside engagement with the community and the social impacts that we're um, actively taking participation in. Um, and uh, yeah, very exciting sort of business model and something's very applicable for a lot of the Alaskan innovators and entrepreneurs out there to sort of 
potentially model as well. And we're always happy to sort of expand and talk further about how important it is to engage both the, the business front, but also think about the social environmental impacts and, and the opportunities that that actually then um, uh, helps bring along to the, uh, to the company itself. So just um, at a really high level, uh, for those who haven't really heard about a Quaggus mission yet, um, and there's some here that have, you know, at this point, you know, heard about PFAS ad nauseum. Um, PFAS is the mission that we're very much on, um, and we are tackling this, this emerging contaminant uh, that is unfortunately affecting and is inside of 99.8% of all Americans' blood. Um, and it's out there, and unfortunately, even at the very lowest concentrations, has measurable and noticeable health effects. Um, this is just a short list of some of the ones that have now been directly linked across to, uh, to PFAS, but that list is continuing as more and more studies continue coming out. And uh, it's a very serious and concerning uh, emerging contaminant that unfortunately has gotten to drinking water supplies around the country and continues to contaminate our water supplies. Um, but you would know PFAS primarily uh, as sort of common brand name. So, sorry, so the slide comes back. Uh, we, are we missing a piece there? Chris, do you know? Yeah, I think I, I skipped over that one. Okay. Well, never mind. I was going to say, like, PFAS is something that, you know, most of you folks would know uh, by common brand names, such as, like, Teflon, Gore-Tex, Rain-X, Scotchgard, um, and so on and so forth. And it's primarily proliferated in the uh, ecosystem and, and uh, through the use of uh, firefighting foams um, that have been used at oil and gas fields, commercial airports, military bases, and so on and so forth. And a lot of Alaska's contamination and, and, and uses come through those air base and airfield uh, deployments of firefighting foams and the contamination of sort of groundwater um, into soil and, and beyond into some of the local water supplies and, and nearby um, uh, affected residents around it. So um, Alaska's got a PFAS contamination story. So do many, many other states in the country and there's PFAS to be found everywhere. And once again, even in the lowest concentrations possible, uh, PFAS is a serious concern. Let me back over to you, Chris, to talk a bit through the construction process. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. So, so kind of looking at at, at what a, the treatment process looks like for remediating PFAS, you see in the upper left, kind of typical source is, uh, as Nigel mentioned, industrial firefighting agents. These are then leaking into into soil, groundwater, uh, surface water. Slide has um, an update for me, Chris. Which one are you seeing? I'm seeing the PFAS affects everyone's health, but I don't know if it's just me. Uh, I'm seeing the destruction problem slide. I'm also seeing destruction problems, so I think we're good, Chris. So oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, back to, yes, PFAS is ending up in soil, groundwater, surface water. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very prolif prolific problem right now, affecting communities across the nation. and uh, a very costly treatment process, uh, as shown here, requires something like a pump and treat system. So uh, the contaminated media is collected um, and then run through some sort of filtration process. So you, uh, what we have shown there is kind of like a granule activated carbon filter. Um, but the problem with this is it doesn't actually eliminate the problem. It, it produces these secondary waste streams, uh, which are typically incinerated or landfilled right now. And both of those have concerns around recontamination um, Incineration uh, has been proven to only partially break down PFAS, creating uh, short chain compounds, which are equally and, and potentially even more toxic um, that end up back in, in uh, emissions from, from incinerators and back into soil and groundwater. And alternatively, uh, landfilling or, or deep ball injection doesn't do uh, even attempt to, to break down these contaminants, but kind of kick them down the curb. So really what what we're developing is a uh, PFAS destruction technology. We like to describe it as a pressure cooker on steroids. So using high temperature, high pressures to completely mineralize PFAS compounds, breaking the carbon fluorine bond, which is one of the toughest bonds in, in organic chemistry. So um, we sit at the back end of this treatment process and, and can pr uh, treat a, a variety of different waste streams that are produced by other technologies and gives us a great opportunity to collaborate with, with other companies and, and technology developers. Um, Nigel, do you want to talk a little bit about journey today? I dropped off, Chris. Just to let you know. Oh, we did? Okay. So yeah, uh, company was, was founded in, uh, at the end of 2019. Um, and we really spent uh, most of COVID uh, focusing on business accelerators, business development work, 
Um, I was recently graduating from the University of Washington, um, and we uh, really relied heavily on some university competitions like the Alaska Airlines Environmental Innovation Challenge, the MIT Water Innovation Prize, um, and then we, we went through the Jones and Foster Accelerator based at UW. Um, towards the end of 2020, we were accepted to the Launch Alaska Tech Deployment Track, which provided great opportunities to engage with stakeholders, customers, and partners working in Alaska. Um, and then really uh, transitioning into 2021, uh, had a, a series of SBIR grants that kicked in from the NSF, EPA, and US Air Force and really accelerated our technical development. Um, so right now we're building out our first uh, containerized pilot system for uh, deployment on at different environment, environmental remediation sites across Alaska. And can talk a lot a bit more about that in coming slides. And then alongside that have been uh, getting more involved in, in trade shows, industry organizations, uh, and just wrapped up the American Water Works Association conference in, in Tacoma this week. So it's um, been a really exciting year and that's kind of what's spurred us along to, to bring folks like Josh and Louie into the team. Um, I, I touched very briefly on, on some of our funding streams to date. Uh, the NSF, uh, originally i -Corps program, uh, which I know Peter's team is very familiar with and I, I think encourages students at UAF to get involved with, um, is really a customer discovery problem going out and looking at uh, real uh, pain points for customers and then trying to develop technologies that, that address those. Um, along with that, we've uh, received a STTR phase one from the NSF doing some materials research around corrosion resistance. Um, and then from the EPA, uh, we were granted the grand prize in the Destroy PFAS Challenge earlier this year, which was a global competition, uh, kind of a blind application scraped of uh, personnel or, or company information, really picking the best technology that had the most, the, the highest feasibility for, for scaling and, and widespread deployment. Um, and, and alongside that also received an SBIR phase one uh, where we were actually treating surface water samples from the Fairbanks airport, uh, demonstrating over 99% destruction uh, of PFAS. And uh, the third SBIR we, we completed this year was through the US Air Force, just wrapped up the phase one a couple of uh, months ago, and now working on a, a phase two proposal. Um, and that's uh, for further work at over at IELTSIN with a couple of companies that are working on pilot demonstrations there right now. Um, and in addition to the SBIR, we've been funded uh, through the CERDIP program and also through the DOE Advanced Manufacturing Office. So this is a little bit of uh, what I mentioned we've got going on in 2021, and I think each of the team members can share a little bit more about where they're kind of plugging into this. Um, some ongoing uh, research collaboration through the, funded through the NSF with Idaho National Lab, University of Washington, um, and then also uh, through the Air Force, SBIR, and CERTIP programs really having an opportunity to engage with DOD stakeholders um, and then, you know, building out some of the other sides of the business with support of accelerator programs like Launch Alaska and uh, the Tacoma Maritime Blue Innovation Incubator, uh, which is where we, ha we have a team working at the, the building on the right there, the Center for Urban Waters. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I wanted to touch on uh, the Arctic Innovator Program. So this is an ORISE fellowship that I'm currently participating in uh, where I, I split time uh, between University of Alaska Fairbanks and Idaho National Lab. Um, and so this is a program funded by the Advanced Manufacturing Office trying to uh, tackle problems with a broad manufacturing impact, um, but also really, really focusing on challenges facing Alaska. Um, and with that kind of point in mind, wanted to touch really specifically on, on what the the impacts of PFAS contamination look like in Alaska. So this is this is highlighting uh, the community of Moose Creek, uh, just downstream of Isleson Air Force Base, um, and decades of uh, firefighting foam use have resulted in in very extensive groundwater and soil contamination, which has impacted uh, private well water well supplies in the community. Um, and as a result of this, uh, they've ended up extending the municipal water supply from uh, the town of North Pole at a cost of $30 million and having to, to connect 185 homes and businesses to municipal water because the, the, the groundwater at their, at their homes is above EPA health advisory levels for, for PFAS. So 
this is this is kind of what what this looks like at a individual community scale but then shifting over to uh kind of alaska as a whole uh it's a big enough problem in alaska that the uh, department of environmental conservation has a dedicated pfas page highlighting you know known source zones and uh sites across the state that have uh, been tested and and detected with with levels above epa advisory levels so as you can see on the left there uh there have been over 500 locations sampled with 136 above health advisory levels and and so this is affecting you know more than 10 communities across the state who are having to look at alternative drinking water supplies like trucking in water bottled water or uh, implementing expensive treatment systems like granular activated carbon or reverse osmosis so um, what's been recognized to date is around 20 million dollars in cleanup costs but this this number is really expected to to increase to the hundreds of millions and potentially billions of dollars in Alaska alone over the next 10 years as regulations uh, kick in. The EPA has just announced a, a timeline for um, potentially uh, designating PFAS as a hazardous waste within the next two years, which would really uh, expedite uh, this cleanup timeline and, and increase the costs as well with, with hazardous waste designation. Um, and, and as I mentioned, that, that $20 million is really only addressing a small part of the problem. Um, and uh, this is really affecting people's day-to-day -day lives with their drinking water supplies, their, their personal gardens, and then kind of downstream industries like commercial fishing, where you know people are concerned about PFAS levels found in, in fish. So uh, just really wanted to kind of highlight uh, this uh, the problem across Alaska and and the intent of programs like the Arctic Innovator to uh, help help address this. So uh, through my time at UAF, I've been involved in a lot of commercialization, commercialization activities. Uh, the photo on the right is over at Allison Air Force Base, uh, meeting with the Innovation Spark Cell, looking at you know their their issues with soil contamination. Um, also working with the Air Force Research Lab and Civil Engineer Center there on base. Um, doing some customer outreach, uh, attended the Web Tech Conference in Chicago a few weeks ago, and recently the AWWA in, in Tacoma. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, our technology is one that, that is complementary with, with the other treatment technologies that have either been developed or are still in development. So uh, having an opportunity to meet with other companies that are developing upstream treatment processes that produce PFAS-rich waste that, you know, needs a safe and effective disposal and destruction option. Um, and then the, the second half of, of this fellowship is, is really focused on the materials and manufacturing innovation. So I'll be in February, uh, hopefully overlap with uh, novel additive manufacturing approaches for corrosion resistance and uh, for app applications, including PFAS destruction. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it over to Louis to give a, a quick uh, background of himself and some of his work. Alrighty, thank you, Chris. So I am I am Louis Bastille. As as I as I said earlier, I am currently a research engineer at Aquaga, and I was born and raised in Fairbanks, Alaska, and then also attended the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So I have a lot of deep ties to Alaska, and uh, and the community within it. And in fact, during my time at UAF, I uh, became involved with Center Ice and, and Peter Webley through our through myself and Josh's senior design project. And then as a follow up with that involvement, we also got to engage in some of the i uh, training programs where it's not quite the full extent of the i program, but you still get to do a lot of customer discovery and reaching out to people and really getting a feel for engaging with the industry and community around you in regards to a specific project. And then shortly after graduating, I, uh, I was able to get a position here at Aquaga. And ever since then, things have been really good, really interesting. Um, being a part of a startup, you don't just, uh, nope, not yet, Chris. Uh, <laughs> You, you don't just find yourself filling the one role, like 
being hired on, I, I knew I had a role at the at the Idaho National Lab working on a project, but at the same time, I've also been deeply involved with a lot of design work, outreach, and even some of the uh, individual um, customer uh, customer discovery that Aquaga has been doing in general. So as, as a startup team, you don't just get this one role, you get to explore and be involved in so much of what goes on within the company. And um, like recently I was involved with AWWA and that's why I'm currently down here in Tacoma with the rest of the company. But on in general, I'm over in Idaho and now you can go to the next page because I'm working on a additive manufacturing project with the researchers over at the Idaho National Lab. And this project has had a focus on utilizing uh, new techniques and new machinery to essentially build up materials, functionally graded materials from the ground up and then creating and then using other advanced machinery to actually fuse them into solid objects. So generally a lot of this is involved in trying to get ceramic properties with metal, with the strengths of metals as well, and kind of combining those together in a way where they can be a solid piece uh, solid single material, but you end up pulling the best properties from either one. And so being a part of this startup has allowed me to get access into the lab where otherwise I would have, I would have had to go through years more uh, research and uh, a lot of government slog in, uh, in hiring processes and all that. But being a part of Aquaga has been, has been great to help with that. And I think Next, uh, we have Josh talking about his experiences as well. Yeah, so uh, like Louis was mentioning, my first interactions with uh, Center Rice here at UAF were through the uh, seed fund that they have available for researchers. And as part of that seed fund, uh, me and Louis went through the uh, i -Core site program together. And towards the end of our uh, project and the beginning of that i uh, curriculum phase, uh, Peter was, uh, was doing his routine shilling of all the other cool things that Center Ice does and uh, mentioned this program called Students to Startups, which is how I got connected uh, with Aquaga. <clears throat> and so it's a program where a uh, bunch of undergrad students applied and I'm not sure what the process was on the startup side, but I'm sure it was similar. Um, and uh, basically went through like a mixer where all the students got to know all the different startups, see if they could find a connection um, to a place that they'd want to work. So uh, the analogy that we used was kind of like speed dating, but for jobs. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, had the chance to uh, meet Chris and meet the other members of the team and Kind of found a common goal of like just Aquaga's one of bit, Aquaga's big goals as a company is just their environmental concern and remediation and um, for me that's also a big concern just in general with like the way things are handled and as I learn more about PFAS it's just like oh well that's a concerning way that people deal with it um, so <clears throat> got to work over the summer as an intern for Aquaga working on some really cool projects that really allowed me to use my engineering degree in a way that I wouldn't have been able to with like a larger company because working for a startup, it's like, oh, well, we need someone who specializes in designing pressure vessels, for example, and kind of look around and it's like, okay, who has free time to learn how to design pressure vessels? So Got to learn how to do that, do some advanced like fluid analysis, um, then also just kind of general process engineering. So figuring out like, okay, we've got this system that takes up this amount of space and needs to connect to this other system that takes up this other amount of space. So what's the best way to organize that and make sure that we're like plumbing things efficiently and all that good stuff. Um, and so working over the summer allowed me to actually transition into staying on with the Quagga um, as I work on my master's degree. So uh, kind of have two main areas that I've been working in uh, during that stuff. 
big one, uh, or at least one of the more visual ones, is I've been doing a lot of work on the trade show displays that we do and marketing materials and that sort of stuff. Basically trying to make sure that as we're putting our name out there, it's sticking in people's head because <clears throat> we don't want to be just another company with blue and white displays at water conferences. So figuring out new and innovative and fun ways to actually stand out. And then another project that I'm working on is um, kind of similar to what Louis is working on, work, doing some uh, metal additive manufacturing, trying to improve our processes as much as we possibly can in some innovative ways and using that as like a proof of concept as we continue to uh, to scale up and you know do prototype and pilot and uh, further and bigger deployments of our technology. Uh, so yeah, uh, one upcoming event we wanted to highlight uh, it's actually happening next next week is uh, there's a screening and town hall discussion uh, of the film Dark Waters, um, which you know is a really captivating story of, of attorney Rob Billet, who led uh, some of the first uh, litigation against the industrial manufacturers of, of PFAS. So this was against DuPont in the Ohio River Valley, I think in West Virginia. Um, and it was a 20 year lawsuit that kind of uh, set some of the ground stones in place for, uh, you know, the accountability and, and manufacturers and, and users of, of these chemicals to uh, start uh, putting the bill for for health uh, for for uh, health management and and uh, cleanup efforts. So uh, this is this is happening next Thursday. We're going to host a viewing party for anybody in Fairbanks at the pub at UAF, um, four to seven thirty. And um, for anybody that is not in Fairbanks and is interested in watching, uh, we'll drop the link in the chat for registration. I think Josh has already done that. So. Um, yeah, I look forward to, to meeting any folks in person who are interested in learning a bit more about uh, PFAS and about our team, and also hearing, hearing the story from, from uh, kind of the attorney who started some of these efforts. So um, with that, we'd kind of like to open it up for Q&A or discussion, um, and yeah, hear from other folks on the call. Thanks, Thanks Chris, Josh, and, and Louis. I, um, great to to see that the different projects that you're working on, the growth that you've been able to as a company go from those initial sort of um, competitions, um, SBIRs, i -cores, customer discovery aspects into some of those seed funded, those funded projects from the different federal agencies. And also seeing that you're tr looking to transition from those phase ones into those uh, phase twos. And I guess while we look for questions from the audience, my, my sort of first question, maybe to you, Chris, as you've been sort of connected with it longer is sort of what was the first sort of things you like ways you looked at to be able to, to support and fund these, this growth? Was it those competitions within your academic institutions? Did you look outside for competition opportunities? Because obviously, some of those have a higher chance of success than a than a sort of federal uh, submission. What was the sort of first approach that Aquaga looked at in terms of being able to fund some of this work? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, obviously, the i was fundamental in kind of pivoting uh, into PFAS destruction as a, as a real focus area. So uh, from there, it was, uh, you know, we were really tr trying to make that transition out of the university and out into, you know, into being an, an actual company. And, uh, you know, for me, coming out of the University of Washington, I, you know, had a really good uh, exposure to some of the entrepreneurial programs in place there. I mentioned the environmental innovation competition and then the uh, accelerator. So, you know, those were kind of small bits and pieces of money along the way to do some early that, that, that helped fund or co-fund some early uh, customer uh, feasibility projects. So, you know, we were able to do that in the summer of last year and then getting our first kind of data point looking at uh, PFAS destruction in an actual real world sample from a solid waste facility, having some of that then helped increase the technical validation going into some of the larger grant programs like the SBIRs. Um, and then kind of as we as we go along and and get more and more data points, it gives us you know more technical validation and helps in, in improve the odds of getting like the phase two awards. So definitely, uh, and then like we've looked at some more like, I guess, 
privately funded competitions, um, but haven't uh, been as focused on that. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to, to think about sort of when you're looking and building up a startup, you see that list of the funding workflow of like, you want to get all potentially all the way to that exit or that purchase, but you come back and there's the friends and family, the, the sort of bootstrapping idea, but also there's the competition type of approach that can be um, funds that can be you can gain that is not equity based, but it's just funding that you can win and then apply to your problem. And, and the same with those federal projects that they are a grant or a, a um, contract, depending on how you're um, where you're applying to. Um, so some of them are a contracted work and some of them are a, a grant based, but it is the funds to complete that work and it's not like a venture, it's not like an actual investment, it's a direct funding to allow you to complete that project work and that can then give you outcomes from those projects that you can then use as your stepping point to the next opportunity or as proof of, of, of as you're pointing out with your work at Fairbanks International Airport that uh, success rate of the destruction then can be your data sets that you can use as you're looking to talk out into the investment community beyond those federally um, or state funded uh, projects. So that's, that's, that's interesting to hear that that, that sort of competition approach and where, you, where you're looking at those internally connected to university was helping you on that bootstrapping early on. So my, I guess I've got a question maybe to, to Josh and to Louis is, is both of you have got engineering degrees and, and you're now working in a startup. What are some of the things that surprised you working in a startup? I think, Louis, you mentioned it in terms of like, based on your skill set, you might be working on something that's outside your traditional wheelhouse. But what are some of the things that surprised you moving in and working with a startup, a, a small team, three, four sort of people, um, just not just beyond sort of like, oh, we'd like you to help with this pitch deck for investors, or can you help put together this uh, trade show uh, set up? What are some of the other things that surprised you in sort of day-to-day -day working for a startup? Well, I think specifically working for Quagga, there's a lot of uh, inter-team communication because I was brought on with, with another two, uh, two people as well at the same time. So we effectively doubled the team size uh, when at the time I was brought on. And there was a lot of communication and direct work between all of us uh, during that, that first week. And then even after branching off, there's just been a lot of communication and, and working together with individual people throughout the company, not so much working with, all right, I have my group, our manager, and then it goes up in, in a structure. It's more so kind of a web of, of management where sure there are people who are technically in higher roles, but you can still directly communicate with, with them and work uh, alongside them as well in a variety of projects, be it working on trade show prep or even um, or even uh, dealing with documentation for a specific project. Uh, all, all of the things are kind of interconnected amongst the people. So yeah, that's, I'd, I'd say that that's one of the most surprising things is just how much you can communicate across the company more so than up. Right. Yeah. Anything you like? Thanks, thanks Louis. Anything you'd like to add, Josh? Uh, yeah, I think one of the big things that wasn't necessarily a surprise so much as like I finally understood what people meant was working for a startup, you get to really experience what people mean when they say that like startups move quickly. Um, I've done research projects at the university and for example, trying to get things just purchased for a purchase order for whatever research funds can take weeks or months to just get a single purchase order put in. Um, and then like working at Aquaga, you know, there've been some things where it's like, hey, I have this idea for a project. I think it would be really valuable and here's why. And, you know, present that to whoever on the team is willing to hear me out. Um, and, you know, the decision can be made that day to be like, okay, let's order the stuff for it today. Here's when it should arrive. When can you get started sort of thing. Um, and so it's it's been a very empowering thing for me as an engineer because it's not been that sort of kind of stifling like, you know, you're just a brand new engineer who just graduated. Your time isn't really worth all that much. Your ideas are bad. 
um, I like mindset that can be prevalent in larger companies. It's been a kind of refreshing change of pace from, from that type of negative mindset to more of a growth mindset. Yeah, I think, th- thanks for that. I think that's definitely the entrepreneurial startup approach where when you're in a smaller team that, that does grow and you look to scale and, and Louis, Louis pointed out that ability to, to, to work, merge across the, 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 the organization and, and work with those outside your project team, but also the ability to adapt to the ideas of your team members, whether it is um, project direction, um, taking a, a risk on something that, that might have a large opportunity that comes from it and be able to work at those um, agile um, opportunities that a larger organization um, doesn't have or, or has the additional uh, paperwork in place that just takes time for it to process through. And sometimes you can miss out on that opportunity. Whereas the, the startup environment um, and the sort of uh, ability to be agile and adapt can actually be, ben- can be quite beneficial when you're trying out something new um, and but just giving that giving people the opportunity to say okay well listen let's listen to what your idea is and then we'll evaluate and move forward rather than saying no from the start because it does take that ability to listen and evaluate because then the, the all of the members of the team feel that their thoughts are being brought forward and that they're being um, understood as an individual as well as part of the team and in, and in the end you end up with that um, good working relationship across the organization rather than more of too, not too much of a hierarchical um, um, process that you might get if you're in a, a much larger organization with very, very much specific divisions that don't cross um, pollinate and, um, on, on ideas. And, and sometimes it just takes a long time for those to come out. So I've got a question from the Q&A and I probably back to Chris. On the uh, slide that you were showing, which was that uh, technical innovation, which was the one with the chemical um, bonds on it, and you described that sort of um, visualization of the of the uh, technology. What are some of the challenges that are that have come from building out the physical um, aquaga equipment that actually then is used to do the uh, destruction? Is it have you have are you have seeing uh, ch- are challenges coming up from being able to construct those in particular locations? Are there large shipping costs, uh, logistical costs that are causing things? Are, are, are there challenges that come from trying to build these types of systems potentially in one location or where materials are coming from different locations? Yeah, the, I, so there's there's kind of the uh, like operational challenges, like what you're describing, sourcing materials, finding good fabrication shops, finding fabrication shops that are interested in doing uh, prototyping work and not uh, producing, you know, 10 parts at a time. Um, and then also on, on the supply chain side, uh, you know, with the disruptions in the electronics market right now. So, uh, you know, traditional vendors for some pieces of equipment. Uh, I, I, I got a quote back the other week that was a, a, a year lead time on something that's like, you know, it's traditionally off the shelf equipment, uh, that uh, is used for like prototyping and in, for re- and in research environments. It's not nothing custom or anything like that. So, um, you know, th- some of that is is very much circumstantial and and uh, you know will be alleviated hopefully in the next few months. But then, uh, you know, then then there's also the the like true R and D challenges, and that's what uh, what's been so beneficial about having research partnerships with with the national labs and universities is to uh, you know, kind of tackle some of those problems one at a time and uh, look at short-term kind of minimum viable product solutions to get something uh, out, and out to market while in parallel actually looking at you know, more innovative applications long-term that potentially reduce cost or you know, improve efficiency. So uh, being able, like having, having a team of different teams doing different efforts, like, you know, two to three year R&D efforts versus like immediate prototype development and not being really dependent on uh, any one piece of technology to get out there uh, in, uh, out to market, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. You're, you're, sometimes you, you don't wanna have sort of all of those, um, a, a potential failure to get to market to be one single point. And you wanna make sure that you're looking at different avenues and different approaches to be able to move forwards. So as you say, you, you hear that there's a, a year lead time on a particular piece of, of equipment, you're like, okay, well that, that 
makes us sit there for six months waiting <laughs> to even hear if that's going to be um, sp sped up. Whereas um, if that's just one aspect, you can still move forward. You can still do those growth areas, um, but being um, able to adapt to type of things of like that, because that's outside. Some of that is outside the, obviously your control. So you need to be organizations need to be aware that those things can can happen and just being able to understand how to adapt and how to be able to still grow and move forwards and continue with some of those r and d's but then when things do come available people being able to pivot and being able to then move over to those shorter time scale projects uh, just means that you can actually then be adaptable in your um, lab to market approach as well as adaptable in your r d as well so it's it's an aspect of of, of the startup uh, world where you can do that, but you've always got to be aware that there are some things outside your control, especially if you're doing some sort of engineering and technological development where you may be delayed, but you need to be adaptable and still move forwards and grow in, um, as an organization. Um, and I, yeah, and I, just one, I think like one of the things that's nice it being in a startup setting is not being tied to specific vendors. You know, you it could be at a big company that has to buy from, you know, a single supplier. And, uh, you know, we're able to, you know, that problem came up and having, you know, a team of uh, people with a lot of hands-on experience who have worked with things like uh, Arduinos, Raspberry Pi, like, you, you know, finding a short-term fix that uh, doesn't, you know, uh, avoids a six-month delay, realizing that, okay, this may not be the long-term solution, but uh, for now it's good enough and it keeps us moving forward. So uh, that like willingness to, to hustle and uh, kind of be agile that that is, you know, very different from, you know other work settings exactly um so I, I i have a couple more questions um from my side um and while we get some others from the attendees so you high, you showed the um the summer-based uh visit that you had to the Arlson air force base which was has led to the s was part of the sbr phase one and is led on to the following on project um, and then I'll bring up the, the, the question um, that, that has been added in again on, on the Q&A. Um, sort of how did, um, with a small business innovation research project, often you might have a point of contact in the organization, if it's a DOD or, or if it's a NSF, a program manager and program officer. How have those, how did you build those connections that helped you then to, to get some of those projects on the ground and actually go and speak to the individuals at those uh, locations was that through mutual connections was it through um dear sir dear sergeant dear lieutenant how did how did those grow and if anybody else listening in was looking at those how what's some of your best advice that you might give somebody that may be looking at some of those um broad area announcements or sbir announcements sort of how did you and how did aquaga make those uh connections yeah, yeah that's a, that's a very good question and uh i mean it's it's groups at universities like Center Ice, like UW has a group called Comotion and, and uh, they have ties to, you know, a lot of other uh, groups that are, that are trying to connect innovation to uh, customers and, and stakeholders and, and end users. So uh, the group, you know, specifically at, at IELTSEN, you know, the, the innovation cell there has been really uh, key in, uh, you know, having a kind of boots on the ground advocate on base who's willing to you know kind of hustle people and and uh you know get things move, moving along where just kind of you, you mentioned saying like a, a dear sir madam email i think doesn't really work with a lot of government agencies so um you know re finding that the groups that have those uh kind of entrepreneurial spirits in them and are trying to uh you know bring innovation into into their organization so um, other groups like there's the National Security Innovation Network. Um, so they, you know, they have uh, a full-time employee at the University of Washington. And, you know, he's not a, not a technical expert by any means, but knows enough to, to connect companies with, you know, who the problem might be, who, who their technology may be applicable to. And, and that's only growing, especially with the DOD, uh, realizing that, uh, you know the U.S. may be years behind other other countries in in innovation, so uh, they're just opening up an accelerator in in the Northwest uh, to kind of help incubate those companies who are you know making those connections and then trying to build a business around it. So, um, and you know that's very very specific to um, Air Force DoD, but uh, you know the the EPA program managers are very similar in in. Uh, seeing like you know what the big picture application is and uh 
you know, there's there's programs as part of the SBIR to to help further customer discovery and like build out a you know commercialization plan. And uh, there's you know a lot of those tools are there. You just have to uh, look for them or uh, you know be open to feedback from them. I think that's one thing that can be an obstacle to uh, commercialization for some folks is is like an ego around you know what they want their technology to be used for and like letting it be driven by customer need versus uh you know like how you personally see it as it its best use case yeah i i i'm glad to hear what you said because i thoroughly agree with it and i think that that, that having that um connection of your network so where um you're able to make those connections whether it be somebody giving you a, um, an introduction to the relevant organization. Um, I know that uh, Louis getting his connection to um, you guys was through through collaborative network. It wasn't sort of Louis having an email seen in a, in a mailing list and saying, dear, dear um, Dr. Woodruff, um, I'm interested in your, it was, a, it was a connecting network that led to those that then led to his opportunity. And the same with Josh, so things like that, I, for those listening in, I think um, if you're looking and seeing opportunities and you know somebody that knows the person, maybe use them as a way to help get you in. You mentioned, Chris, the, the UW um, Ensign um, director that, that works there. And obviously he has a footprint across the Pacific Northwest as well. So how to use that to say, hey, do you know somebody at Joint Bears Elmondorf Richardson's Arctic Spark Lab? OK, yeah. Can you get me an introduction and get me on a call and, and then use that as a connecting point? Often you can get um, a much faster interaction with the, with the end user or with it, with the um, program manager if it's, if it's NSF or, or, or um, EPA. So uh, good to hear. I've and I think, more. oh, just, oh, I was going to say, I think like expanding the, the uh, interpretation of the Northwest or the Pacific Northwest to, to, you know, to include Alaska because a lot of the organizations are, are trying to tackle, you know, similar problems. Uh, across Washington, Oregon, and, and Alaska, and you know, strengthening relationships between groups in, in different states, and uh, you know, that that's definitely uh, something that that I've heard a lot with with groups in, in in Washington is is trying to to get better connected in Alaska. Exactly, and I and um, actually that was highlighted with the Alaska Airlines competition that you guys won when it was actually expanded out to include Alaska. Um, and for, for applicants and, and and that was beneficial so i i know that it's a it's it's going and there's the at regional director on the ensign as well so another question um for anonymously um on the q a was question on, on the additive manufacturing being used in the reactor where is the prototyping coming up to that and what are some of the physical bills that have been developed maybe this is a a shared question with louis because of the work that's going on either national lab sort of where is what, what are some of the um, maybe highlighting what you've been able to do at Ilson and at Fairbanks International with those um, already existing um, projects? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's the, I don't want to get into too many technical weeds in here. So I'm happy to share my contact information in the chat and have a uh, more in depth follow on conversation. But, uh, you know, that's the I, I mentioned kind of these parallel parallel paths of of using off the shelf. Uh, equipment and and you know pretty standard materials and manufacturing practices for for prototyping but then doing some of this more cutting edge uh materials and manufacturing research for you know bigger picture longer term broader application so you know that's uh obviously there were some uh delays with like things like national lab access during during covid so you know that's really starting to pick up in the last couple months and then you know having our our team members actually on site at uh, places like INL and then you know the project Josh is Josh mentioned he's doing you know there's no there's no uh, that that's a personal FDM machine it's you know very very different uh approach to metal additive manufacturing so um kind of you know getting very very creative with with ways to pursue that but also now like just uh just starting to get access to some of the you know bigger equipment at the national lab facilities yeah, I, th I think um, 
you, you highlighted there that that sort of approach in in the startup environment that there is the technology that as you're building up the company you've got this technology but also you're looking at new opportunities to go in parallel with the the existing um and the the prototyping and and the uh, technologies that that you might start off with um as the company looks to build so you've got your initial phase of growth but also at the same time you're looking at what's the potential to scale what's the potential to to have the newest technology in your hands as an organization so you're most competitive when you're looking to get follow-on projects or if you're going on to a phase three you want to be that sole source um phase three opportunity for the federal government you might be requested by other agencies outside those that have supported the work so you want to have that um that technical sort of final that that um state-of-the-art system that you could then be uh, um, brought in to support another agency that is not one of the original ones that um, funded uh, that funded the work. So, um, so I, I see that there's another response on the uh, the Q and A, uh, and and uh, we'll we'll um, we can see if Chris can share his information and and be able to continue chatting afterwards. Because I think what I'd like to do before we as as we look to to before we look to wrap up is maybe come back to Josh and Louie and and for those others from within the academic environment that are looking at at, um, at sort of opportunities for experiential student learning um, beyond the sort of traditional sort of here's a practical uh, project and, and work upon what advice would you give to a sophomore junior or even a fresh uh, a freshman student in the university environment on on um, the benefits that this has led for you moving forwards, what would you give them as advice, maybe advice you would give, like Chris would ask on this advice for, for startups, what would you give to students at their junior or sophomore time frame of, of um, and what projects they're looking for? So maybe Josh, I see you're on mute of you first, um, as you're now in your master's, and then Louis, you're now outside the university environment. What might you give back to your? Maybe your. What would you give advice? Would you give you to yourself from three years ago or two years ago? So over to you, Josh. I, I think the biggest thing is don't be afraid to start projects where you have no clue what you're doing, um, because there's only one way to learn, and that's by not knowing things to begin with. Um, so like, if there's like uh, opportunities that come up, and it's just and you're like, well, I kind of think I'm unqualified for that. Uh, so I'm not gonna apply, just like apply for the opportunities or talk to the person who's running it or that sort of stuff. Because more often than not, those are um, things that people would like to see and not 100% requirements. And like, you can always learn things on the job. So like say yes to things, uh, apply for things that you don't necessarily think you're qualified for and um, kind of just get out there and try about a whole bunch of different things. Because if you have one path where it's like, I wanna do this, I'm gonna graduate and apply to these four companies and get a job at one of them and everything will be hunky-dory. Um, and then you get there and you realize that that job is not what you want to do, actually. You don't have anything to fall back on. So if you get a bunch of different like experiences doing a whole bunch of different things, then you'll be able to, uh, to really decide both what you want to do and just have that broader knowledge base to work from. Great, thanks. Thanks for that, Josh. Um, Louis, anything from your side you want to add that, that um, you, you would say to yourself from two or three years ago or the, the the, the next student coming through the engineering program that's looking at opportunities? Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely echo a lot of what Josh said. It's, it's a lot of taking advantage of opportunities as they as they come or, or become available because you might not know everything right now, but that's actually what a lot of uh, situations and opportunities kind of expect. Like, sure, they, they say that, oh, you need to already know this stuff, but not just in startup world, but in a lot of research areas, they kind of assume you have the lowest uh, level of, of knowledge about the subject to begin with. And so a lot of on-site training and, and development goes, and so you just got to take advantage and, and really pay attention to what happens along those paths. And then um, another important thing is if you're interested in an area of, of development and, and research, definitely try and like hone in on different conferences, different events, and 
reaching out to companies that are involved with that stuff ahead of time. And even, even if you're in your sophomore or junior year, getting connected to those companies ahead of time is going to be infinitely more valuable than just sending out uh, different job applications and hoping that they respond. But um, so getting involved with conferences are also going to be a really good way of, of expanding that reach and uh, in finding all those different places. I know just being involved in AWWA recently, I'm already about, I'm already working on scheduling a talk with different water treatment offices around both West and East coasts, just based off of um, talking with people at, at the, at the exhibit hall. And so a lot of those opportunities that Josh mentioned, they can lead into so much more. And a lot of them, not all of them will just come. You have to, you have to do some outreach. You have to go out and, and look for some of them yourself as well. And so that's, that's kind of the big takeaway is you can't, you can't just sit and then try and worm your way into, um, in, into an industry after you've already finished with school, it's important to be involved in, in that outreach and that discovery while you're still in school as well. And that, that's something that I definitely didn't take advantage of nearly as much as I should have uh, during school. Yeah, it's, it's a sort of like a, a, biz, a um, employment discovery type of approach, sort of the, you, if you're sitting there waiting for something to come to you, you'll still be graduating with a degree at a certain grade point. But if you actually take that call or make that call or make that con go to that event or turn up to a webinar on opportunities, they're like, oh, I'm not really sure. It's like, I'll just go and listen in because who knows where it might actually lead to and what um, it could come from it because then you're, you're, you're no worse off than you were before you made that inquiry, before you made that connection. You've actually potentially... It may be like, no, I don't want to go down that avenue, but at least you've got that input to say, no, that's not for me. Okay, now what's the next one? So you're being proactive. And I think um, increasing that proactiveness as, um, as students are going through their degree program, understanding people have got uh, busy schedules and, and you're looking at the time and the investment that you could have on, on growing that. But I think seeing the two of you here continuing, uh, Josh, continuing to work with Aquaga beyond the students of startups, Louis, getting this opportunity to go to Idaho National Labs that came because Josh was in the Students of Startups, Josh and Louie were in the i program. We were actually at one of your i events and, um, and we, were taught, we ended up chatting afterwards about this opportunity with Aquaga for Idaho National Labs. And that's what sort of led to this um, collaboration that now you, Louie, have this position beyond your degree. So it was the network you had the that often it's just asking and, and not just sitting there and hoping that something will come to you is but is is moving forwards but not everybody has that extrovert aspect in themselves but it's skills you can learn and you can 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 then adapt and use and and now you're doing more than just your original engineering background you're you're building up these skills to be a more resilient part of the aquaga the aquaga team so um, as we're coming up to the top of the hour, um, I want to thank uh, our presenters today from the Aquaga team. Uh, we had Chris um, and Nigel uh, early on, and Chris then led the presentations, and we had Josh and, and Louis. Um, so grateful for all of you for your time. Uh, thank you for those attending in. Um, we'll, we'll make sure that this is shared online, so be able to share this uh, to your colleagues and friends for anybody wanting to come in and learn um, about what Aquaga is doing. Um, so we're um we're now um oh yeah, and don't forget the um film that's coming up uh next week um at the university pub for those that can uh, physically meet in meet um and then for those online there'll, there'll be the um event so that's four to seven thirty alaska time um contact information for our presenters from aquaga anybody calling in there's a uh, attendee uh, form you can fill out to, to gain some swag and some prizes. So um, if you've forgotten to do that, please do please do that for any of our events during the week. Um, and Chris has shared the contact information for everybody. So um, please do get in touch. Different aspects if if you're if you're listening in um, on and um, you're a student and you're interested in that what that opportunity led for Josh and Louis, or you're just interested in more in general about um, Aquaga and its projects it's working on. Uh, then obviously you've got the contact information for the four of them, um, both more about their Tacoma facility that they're based at, some of the project work they're doing, 
uh, the work that Louis is doing at INL and the other SBIR opportunities that are coming that Chris highlighted. But yeah, I just wanted to say thank you again for your time today, uh, guys. Um, and um, Chris, if you've got anything else you'd like to wrap up with, otherwise we'll uh, sign off. No, just a thank you to Peter and Kevin for hosting the event. Uh, and yeah, hope to see some folks in at the pub next week. Uh, we'll follow up with a, you know email, maybe if we can maybe distribute something through Center Ice with some more details. Um, and I know Josh is gonna invite a few student friends and I'm gonna uh, try to reach out to a few uh, partners we're working with in the Fairbanks area as well. So. Yeah, of course. And I'd, I'd be happy to work out what we can do from Center Ice. And if not, we can share it across the students of startups, students, uh, Josh from last summer as well. So um, and some of the other um, researchers that we've supported through Center Ice Seed Fund, uh, we can at least send it to them for because the majority of those are based in Fairbanks. Um, but on